Hi there, I'm Ari, I'm the Oak Witch, and in today's video we're going to go over the fundamentals of magic. Magic is notoriously super difficult to define. I think a lot of people tend to go for Aleister Crowley's definition, which is magic is the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with the will. To be honest, whilst I don't necessarily disagree with this um, definition, I don't think I've really ever found a definition which really feels right for me. I think the one thing that I do know is that magic is something which you do. And in order to better understand what magic is in general and specifically what magic is to you how it feels like to you and how you're going to experience it obviously you have to practice you have to experience it i think many magical practitioners would feel comfortable in saying that magic is the idea of seeking change we practice magic in order to enact these changes in our lives and what these changes are can be many different possibilities of which we'll sort of discuss later on. I guess it is important to acknowledge that magic does have its limits. You know magic cannot change my eye colour to green as much as I want it to. Magic I think is important to consider it takes the path of least resistance. So people say this because it's following the idea of if I'm doing a house hunting spell and I do the spell at my altar I then need to go out and seek and hunt houses and fill in that, you know, apply for houses in order to potentially get blah blah blah. I need to follow through that mundane process in order to actually, uh, for the spell to work. Many different magical practitioners will have their own definition of magic which suits them. And a part of understanding what magic is when you're a beginner, it's, it's a long process, it's, you know, it's not something which you're gonna necessarily be able to understand overnight. The most important thing to consider is that what magic is to you is specifically to you. It's your experience, your subjective experience, your journey. Throughout magical history, many have posited different metaphysical laws, um, you know, principles of magic. A notable example is the Gabalion, which identified seven different principles of magic. What I want to discuss here is just a few which I feel are quite present within witchcraft. Another thing to note is that these aren't necessarily rules per se. They're essentially just explanations for how magic works, if that makes sense. They're principles of magic, so but they're not rules. They don't have to be like this dogmatic thing that you follow to a T. Like it's, it's just an explanation of how magic works in a certain context. So one of the laws which has been established is the law of knowledge. This is a really simple law. It's the idea of knowledge brings control related to witchcraft. Understanding a topic in that basic research level will help you gain the power to practice more efficiently. And this principle can heavily relate to the axiom know thyself. Knowing yourself, knowing who you are, how you work, your, you know, what makes you tick, your strengths, your weaknesses. Knowing yourself in this very personal and deep way can help you understand the world better around you, understand how you fit in this world. Another metaphysical law is the law of correspondence. Now this basically entails that our physical world and the spirit world, the other world, are inherently like they're interconnected. These planes of existence can interact with each other and they are connected to each other. This is also paralleled with the hermetic phrase as within so without, as above so below. So it's this idea that the microcosm is reflected in the microcosm and vice versa. And because of this reflection we get correspondences for things like plants, for crystals, we can get planetary correspondences and astrological correspondences from this idea. We can use that idea of this correspondence, this reflectiveness, and we can utilize that energy in our magical workings. So another very popular principle of magic is the law of similarity. Now this essentially just means like attracts like. Effects resembles causes and things that resemble each other can further affect each other. We're looking at witchcraft, we're looking at a spell, what we do in spells is we visualise, we visualise our intention, we have affirmations to line up with this goal. So this idea of visualising your intention that you want 
like can attract that like. And we also see this in the correspondences that we have. We use gold in, for example, maybe success workings or money workings. So if we look at gold itself as a material from the earth, as a mineral, it's something which is one, quite expensive in our sort of modern society. And it's something that which is also quite luxurious in a sense because of its expense. So we treat it as something which is related to money, obviously. So we use that idea, that correspondence in our success workings as that is what we're trying to attract. So another law is the law of contagion. Now this essentially says that the physical contact we have with things can establish a connection. So when we make physical contact with something, even after separation, there is still a metaphysical connection between those two things. Another law is the law of polarity, which goes to the idea of polar opposites. Now this law essentially says that these opposites that we may have are the same thing, but on different degrees. So examples given could be hot or cold, dark and light, positive and negative. These things are the same essence, but varying degrees of this same thing. Of course, they can interact when you sort of meet in the middle. And I think, for example, when you're looking at light and dark, it's measuring the darkness in the light and the lightness in the dark. Another law which I wanted to talk about is the law of cause and effect. Now, this essentially just says that everything has a reason. Every cause has its effect and every effect has its cause and nothing happens just for no reason. And the last law which I'll talk about is the law of gender. And this essentially says that there is masculine and feminine energy in all things. And I think it's important to note that the idea of masculine energy and feminine energy don't necessarily have anything to do with sex. But yeah, those are those are just some laws. There are many more that I'm missing out. And many more which I'm sure many witches do use. So understanding these metaphysical laws, these principles of magic, can help you understand what magic is better, how it works, and how people have sort of described how it should work in a sense. So I think having that like understanding, that base understanding, even if you don't ascribe to all of them, knowing what they are can be quite um, enriching for your own craft. So yeah, so when we're looking at magic, what people have also liked uh, to do is split magic into digestible categories or labels that fit either aesthetic or functional purposes. What I also find is that people tend to fit magic in a like binary sense and I'll go over some which uh, you would have probably already have heard of. So the first sort of set of binary descriptor I guess is this idea of folk magic versus ceremonial magic. Now to give a super brief description of the two, folk magic is something which I see as more practical, it's more achieving change in a mundane sense and ceremonial magic is more dualistic, it's more approaching the divine and achieving change in a higher consciousness sense. People have also used different words for this, so we have folk magic and ceremonial magic, and we have people have said low magic versus high, metamergy and theurgy, I'm probably not pronouncing this right, and active versus passive. I don't necessarily use any of these other words, I just use folk and ceremonial, that makes the most sense to me. But people have used these labels to sort of talk about this similar adjacent idea. If we're looking at folk magic, I view it as this down-to-earth, like nitty-gritty magic. And folk magic is typically defined by the use of spells and charms. It's important to note that folk magic is also not a singular thing. It's not a monolith. And there are many different folk magic traditions across cultures all across the globe. When you're looking at folk magic from different cultures, it's important to research properly, research the history, the culture, why they do things the way they do, why they practice that magic in that way, and listen to the voices of people from that culture. That is important. So yeah, anyway. <laughs> Ceremonial magic tends to be defined by the use of ritual or ceremony. So ceremonial magic is practiced in a more divine sense. You are expanding your consciousness, perhaps 
uh, evoking or invoking spirits and people described it as you know achieving oneness in yourself people view ceremonial magic as more spiritual rather than practical some ceremonial magic examples i guess in the western occult sphere is the kabbalah you look at enochian magic you can look at the lemma demonology there's very many that i'm missing out the issue with these distinct labels is that they do interact you can practice witchcraft in a spiritual sense and you can practice ceremonial sen ceremonial magic in a practical sense and i think that when you're looking at specifically certain magical traditions for example uh, Gemma Gary's work, where is it? I think down there somewhere. <laughs> when you're looking at Gemma Gary's work, she describes a tradition of witchcraft which is folk ceremonial. There's a definite combination of the two or that it exists somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. So that's just one example. There are many different examples. So the second set of like binary descriptors of magic which I see is the contrast between beneficial and baneful magic. Now before I get into the definitions, different labels that people have used for this, um, these types of magic. So for example, if you look at beneficial and baneful, people have given white versus black magic, light versus dark magic, and obviously positive versus negative. For me, I think the best descriptors are beneficial and baneful. I think they're more accurate descriptions. So when you're looking at beneficial magic, this is magic which is done in a beneficial sense. Don't really need to explain it much further. And you're looking at baneful magic it is essentially the opposite. So we're looking at magic done in a way to perhaps harm someone. Again, like I said before in the focus of ceremonial, baneful and beneficial exist on a spectrum. Okay, I think we can all look at morality and we can say that it's not as black and white as that. I don't think it's useful to perhaps put this idea of ethics in magic as something which is either good or bad because sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do and justice isn't always happy and positive. When we're getting into perhaps more intricate and complicated situations, you know, ethical dilemmas, baneful magic isn't necessarily negative, sometimes it could be positive and sometimes beneficial magic can actually be harmful. So it's important to consider that sometimes these ex like these really distinct descriptors and viewing them in the sense that they can't overlap is quite unhelpful and unrealistic. Another thing to say is that the idea of white versus black magic is seen as quite racist in the modern witchcraft movement. Scholars have used these labels in a historical sense for quite a few years now, but in the modern witchcraft movement we tend to step away from those labels because of the connotations in, for example, the US where African-American magic and religion, so we're looking at like hoodoo or voodoo, are seen as negative and there is large misportrayals, misrepresentations of their sacred religions and spiritualities in a way which is so unjust and unfair and the stereotype is black magic in connotations with those practices and obviously that's not true and that's not necessarily a fair representation so when we're looking at white versus black magic we tend to rid of those terms as they're unhelpful and racist. It's also worth considering that, again, like I said, it's a spectrum. And I think that when we're looking at just magic, magic is just magic. Magic can do both harm and good in a very similar sense. So if we're looking at a tool, magic is a tool, and we're looking at a hammer, which is an example people like to give. A hammer can be very helpful. A hammer can be destructive, and you might use a hammer to tear down a wall in your house if you're trying to expand the room. And that destruction is beneficial, that's helpful. But a hammer can also be used to harm someone in very obvious ways. And that obviously is painful. So a hammer is just a hammer though. You don't say that's a bad hammer. You don't say that's a good hammer. The hammer is just the hammer. It's the person who's using the hammer in which you would place that descriptor on. Very simple example which you could probably dive a bit more into but let's just leave it at that for now to describe magic as the idea is that the magic itself isn't black nor white it's something which you know 
the witch should think about their own intentions, their own experience of magic and the way they're using it and the consequences that they will want to face and the changes they want to seek. And another set of these binary descriptors is the idea of left hand path versus right hand path. Now just to say this is not something which I really, I don't use these terms but many people would do. So the left hand path to my understanding it's the idea of breaking these society norms, stepping outside of those norms and branching out to things which are slightly more taboo. And the right hand path is essentially the opposite. <laughs> it's not doing those things, it's being a bit more traditional and adhering to the social conventions that exist. Um, and yeah. So I'm pretty sure these came from Indian Tantra. Many people have viewed left hand path, right hand path as like left hand path basically like being okay with cursing and painful magic and right hand path being like only doing beneficial magic. To my understanding it originated in something which is more centering around the idea of taboo. And so now we're going to go on to other different types of magic which are a bit more singular and are specifically framed in a functional or aesthetic sense. So the first type of magic I want to discuss is sympathetic magic. Now this is obviously closely related to the law of similarity but it essentially says if there is a symmetrical quality you can establish that connection. So one example in English folk healing magic is the idea of healing warts. So you'd rub some natural material, what I've read is the straw, you'd rub that on the wart and then you would bury it somewhere and as the straw decays so will your warts. Another notable example is something I spoke about in my protection video is abracadabra. Now people have used this charm for both healing and for both self-defense magic it's the idea of as this word diminishes, so obviously it kind of like looks like a triangle, so shall your illness. So it's the idea of using that similar connection in order to establish that change. So the next type of magic is contagion magic. Now obviously this follows the law of contagion, which where two things which are now separated were once connected still have that metaphysical connection and you can use that in magic. A really obvious example is tag locks, you know the idea of using something which represents somebody, you know, your target in your magical workings. So a tag lock example is hair or nail trimmings, things that obviously belong to a person and after they have been separated from that person they still have that connection to that person. When we follow this principle, this idea in magic, it's why we cleanse or purify objects that once belonged to someone else or just in general before we use them for our own magic as they may have underlying energies lingering on that object which you don't want interfering with your magic. So this is why we cleanse and we purify. And the way I understand it is that Sympathetic and contagion magic can interact quite closely and these two laws can and it's something which you see in for example poppets. Many people call poppets voodoo dolls but I don't like to use that term and plus poppets have existed in many different cultures. Poppets aren't necessarily inherently baneful magic Puppets can be used for any type of magic you want and have been used for many different purposes. For example in English folk magic puppets have been used for healing. Uh, but anyway, so this idea of contagion and sympathetic magic interacting, obviously we look at puppets, you make them, you dress them in a way in which they're meant to resemble your target, so that is sympathetic magic. And the contagion magic is where, for example, many people put in hair of their target inside the puppet as that is obviously the contagion magic working. So they do interact and they're quite closely related in that sense. Um, but as many different types of magic can interact, so just thought I'd give an example as to how they can. Now some really simple, more popular types of magic can include love magic. Love magic essentially just entails attracting more love into your life, be this self-love or attracting a new relationship or strengthening a familial bond or even with friendship. Healing magic, as discussed before, just entails magic for healing. With healing magic I guess it's obviously the idea of practicing magic in order to heal oneself or someone else. I would say obviously healing magic is fine but I have to do the obligatory you know don't rely on magic to, just to heal obviously like modern medicine and like seeking professional advice is 
should be your first and foremost priority and your first step but in general I don't think it's wise to immediately resort to magic for issues in your life. Magic is great as an aid, as a tool to help in those situations, but it shouldn't be your only solution. But that runs through magic in general, not just healing magic. But yeah. Prosperity magic entails doing magic in order to gain something, again abundant prosperity workings are usually for example, we look at money magic as a type of prosperity working or even just general success magic. I guess also like luck magic also fits into this category. Another type of magic is protection magic. Now, this is essentially what it says on the tin. It's magic used in a protective sense. It can also refer to self-defense magic or reversals or uncrossings and generally just ways to protect oneself in all senses of the word. If we're looking at protection magic, other sort of adjacent protection magic examples can be things like binding magic. Now this type of magic can include binding two things together or preventing someone from, for example, doing further harm. Adjacent to this idea is magic such as cleansing or purification. This is just getting rid of unwanted energies or spirits that you don't want in your space, bad vibes as people like to say. It's the idea of getting rid of those things. So cleansing I guess is more gentle and purifying is essentially getting rid of everything, both good and bad, both the wanted and unwanted and completely purifying the object, the space, yourself, a person, whatever. Banishing magic also kind of gets into this idea as well to banish something, banish more specifically an entity, a spirit out. There's also types of magic that essentially work towards enhancing your like psychic ability or your sort of skills specifically relating to magic. I guess this has its own sort of category of magic but I'm not really quite sure what I'd call them, psychic enhancement magic. Um, they're kind of its own thing, I guess, but that is a thing that people use magic for. And honestly, I guess another type of magic would be like activism magic. So this will be looking at things like justice, spells for retribution to seek justice of a situation. This type of magic isn't really talked about a lot, but I do think it's actually quite a key part of magical traditions you know across the globe another type of magic is natural magic so this is magic essentially relating to the natural world now that's very very broad so this can be plants crystals it can also be things like the weather it could be astrology it could be planets even but obviously when we're looking at plant magic people tend to use the term green magic or just herbal magic but I think people tend to use those interchangeably for the same thing which is just generally using plants in your magical practice. Another one which is closely related is kitchen magic. Now this essentially just refers to magic of the kitchen. <laughs> when you're cooking, when you're baking, any magic that you do regarding maybe food and or drink, not even necessarily the kitchen but just generally related to food and drink is kitchen magic. Obviously you get elemental magic so this is just magic of the elements, um, again super broad descriptor, usually split into the different elements so people generally in modern witchcraft world recognise air magic, water magic, fire magic, earth magic. Brief examples, air magic might look at incense or the storm magic, weather magic, fire magic obviously you're going to look at like candle magic, water magic going to be looking at using water in witchcraft. <laughs> A popular modern witchcraft example is the idea of making moon water and obviously earth magic which I mean you could fit anything in there but people tend to view things that come from the earth. Planetary magic is essentially working with the planets in magic so obviously you can look at general planets in our solar system but it also does tend to refer to the moon and sun as well in some senses but generally you're looking at like the planets and lunar magic kind of has its own category of working with the moon lunar phases you can use planetary magic for a lot of different things in your magic so this can be like invoking or evoking like the planets and their planetary energies or this can be using planetary timings in your magic 
all sorts of things that you could consider. So yeah, lunar magic, which I spoke about, is working with the phases of the moon, for example, or the moon in general, whether this be making moon water, doing full moon meditations, all sorts of things you can do with the magic of the moon. The next magic, which I'll talk about, is chaos magic. Now, this is a very popular form of magic in the modern witchcraft movement, and a lot of people tend to get it wrong. So people think that chaos magic is just doing whatever you want, and being really, like, random, but that's not what chaos magic is. Yes, chaos magic is non-dogmatic, but it's the idea of using your belief as a tool in order to effect changes. So whatever works, works. But it's the idea of utilising different beliefs in order to achieve a goal in magic. And the next type of magic I'll talk about is sigil magic. Now, this is closely related to chaos magic, but the term sigil itself simply just refers to a symbol used in magic and sigil magic at a base level is the idea of crafting a symbol which reflects a intention or your goal in magic. So it is popularly known from Chaos Magic from Austin Ospen Spare who came up with this revolutionary idea of how to create sigils. There are many different ways now that people make sigils. People do often go for the Austin Osom Spare method, which is obviously very popular, but people do tend to branch out into other ideas as well. So yeah. And I guess the last thing I'll touch on is divination. Uh, divination is not specifically magic and it's not specifically witchcraft either. Divination has existed across many different cultures in history for years, for like hundreds and thousands of years. But obviously many modern witches use divination in their modern magical practice. Many witches use divination to aid in their spell work, many witches use it to foretell the future. Many people see this idea of foretelling the future, some people do see it in a strict sense as things that are going to happen, and some people view it as a guiding idea of what is possibly heading your way, perhaps messages from a spirit guide, from your ancestors, from your deities, and still have that sense of um, free will and being able to control that outcome, but just having a idea of what is perhaps to come. Divination, I think, requires its own video because there are many things to consider and there are many things to uh, discuss when it comes to using divination magic, but Obviously people do sort of see it as its own form of magic nowadays because it's something which is so entrenched into modern witchcraft. The study of magic is so vast and so complicated and I think that you could spend a lifetime studying magic and you'd probably not really be done. I think that magic is beautiful, it's amazing and it's also something which is unexplainable and it's hard to define but I'm coming to the end of my video now and I hope that you enjoyed it I hope that I was able to describe magic in a simple way for beginners um, obviously there are loads of things I missed out I would not be able to describe everything in magic there are magic is so broad of a term it's so wonderful and vast and honestly this video is just dipping a toe into the ocean that is magic. But yeah, I think what I wanted to highlight from this video is understanding the theoretical views of magic can actually help you in your practical sense of applying magic. So having that base understanding can actually be really helpful and I hope this video has contributed to that. So yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like because it helps me out. And if you want to support me further, then you can find me on Patreon, where my minimum tier is one pound. It does help support this channel and making the quality of the content you're watching better. So you can do so if you wish. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.